We're going to be in Romans. We're going through Romans again. We're, we're, we're heading down into the home stretch, actually, right? Chapter 16 is the last chapter of this great book by, by Paul. And we're in, actually, today, we're going to be in the scriptures that Paul writes here in the letter to the Romans, the Roman church, as he writes this from Corinth, the city of Corinth. And here in, verse, in chapter 14, we're going to go through verses 13 to 23. Everybody open up your Bibles to that. Right? Chapter 14, verse 13 to 23 of Romans. Anybody need a Bible this morning? Raise your hand. We can get you a Bible. Everybody's got one? That's awesome. That's great. So he says here, Paul, as we continue on in this chapter, as we finish this chapter, he says this. I know, well, first of all, he says, Therefore, let us not judge, verse 13, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Verse 14, he says, Now I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one from whom Christ died. Verse 16, therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Verse 19, therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace in the things for which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is, is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. And the last verse, verse 23, Paul ends it here. He says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, or whatever is not from faith is sin. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we take these words this morning from the Apostle Paul. And Lord, I pray this morning that these words will come to us in a way maybe we've never thought about them before or never received them before in our hearts, Lord, as we heard these words this morning or maybe heard them previously, Lord. But I do pray this, Lord. I know you're in the midst. I know the Spirit is here amongst us right now, Lord. And I pray, Lord, the Spirit would move in a way that would touch hearts this morning, would open minds this morning for ears to hear, for things on a personal level, Lord, and as, and as a church, Lord, your church, the church that you've given us here this morning, in this place, in this time, in this hour, Lord, that we would walk out of here, and I pray this every week, Lord, that we would walk out of here changed, whatever the way that is that you want us to change, Lord, for us individually, and also, Lord, again, as a congregation. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 Great here, awesome here. You're probably saying, if you've never read this chapter, and we obviously, we started at the beginning of chapter 14, I'll give you a real quick a quick synopsis of where we were in the beginning of the chapter and really kind of what he's talking about here there was a there was division going on in the church right the Roman church between what what is clean and what is unclean to eat as far as food and why was that conflict well you had a church that was mostly they were Gentiles and Jews together and the Jews were like oh they were getting offended that the that the Gentiles pagans they were eating food that was that was given up to idols. And so there was kind of like, there was a lot, a lot of questioning going on here. But here's the thing. What's going on here, as Paul gave us kind of in the beginning of the chapter, he's saying these are things that are, not, these are disputable things. This is not doctrine. And he's kind of, as we'll go through these verses this morning. And it's not to say we, we don't have strong convictions. That's not what Paul is saying here. Because when the Bible speaks, Clearly, we, we must understand it and live that, right? And Scripture teaches that, that God's sovereignty and our, our responsibility. But here, 
Here's what we're talking about this morning. There are things that are essential doctrine, and there are things that we have to take that firm stand. But here, these are what Paul's talking about. In some kind of way, they're non-essential. These are non-essential things that he's talking about, and we, that shouldn't split us and divide us. And I've seen that in churches, right? And here at Calvin Chapel, we accept a lot of a lot of views from people that come in, and we just you know we look at that and we look at it, and we take it, and we take it from Scripture. But there's also things that are kind of like God leaves up to us to decide, for our conscience to receive and accept one another, and that's called the Spirit of Grace, by the way. And here's what Chuck Smith says. Here's what Pastor Chuck Smith says. It's important to recognize. Now listen, that we can agree to disagree. You hear that, Christian? We can agree to disagree and here still maintain a spirit of unity and love. Praise the Lord. That's Pastor Chuck Smith. And that's what I kind of, you know, I, I take that to heart. I take that from Pastor Chuck. And here's some of the things that even Christians, you know, sometimes I don't know if you've ever been involved in things that are disputable, if you will, right? That we can degree, disagree and agree on. Here's some of them. How about the Bible you're reading, right? People say, well, you, know, you can only read the King James. Well, I got the New King James. Oh, I got the New Living Testament. I got the New, uh, New American Standard. People have discussions about that, and people will actually get offended if you're reading enough. Some people that read King James will say, it's nothing but the King James. Well, those are disputable things. Hey, you read what the Lord wants to write. The Lord wants to write on your heart. That's what it is. But those are disputable things. That's not doctrine, right? Uh, how about we just talking this morning? about the rapture, about the timing of the rapture. There's Christians that believe that the rapture comes, the church is out of here, but there's some that believe that the rapture comes in the middle, that the rapture comes at the end. And Christians will divide over that. And sometimes even separate out over it. When God says, don't do that. Those are disputable things. Calvinism, Arminianism, all oh, we can have these discussions. These are disputable things. And here what Paul will show us this morning that these are things that should not separate us or divide us, that we still should walk in unity and love of Christ Jesus through the spirit of grace. Amen? But there's many, many more things. How about schooling of children, right? Some parents want to homeschool. Some parents put kids in parochial school, public school. Politics. Christians divide over politics. Disputable things. Or even how about holidays? We remember we talked about Halloween. Some people won't let their kids go out on Halloween. Well, that's again, that's something that should be on your conscience. However the Lord leads you, that's up to you. It's not a doctrine. But Christians will separate because of stuff like this. And that's what Paul's kind of, in a bigger picture here, here's what he's saying. And again, I just laid that groundwork, right? There's a, there's a, there's a kind of difference of opinion going on here between the Jews and the Gentiles here in the Roman church. And here's what Paul's getting at in these scriptures we read this morning. Here's really the basis of it. He's saying, and I'll say this to you, am I causing others to stumble? In your walk sometimes with Christ, or even in the things that we believe, and some of these non-disputable things, these things that we can agree to disagree on. And Paul now, what he's doing here in these verses, he's changing sides actually here now. And he advises, like there's two camps here, right? You could almost kind of say there's the liberal, the free ones, right? The Gentiles, they're free. They're not under the law. And the Jews were kind of still kind of stuck into the Levitical laws, the religious laws. And these critical, and here's Paul speaking to these two camps. And he's saying, he's now going to speak to the criticized, the ones that are being criticized. And before he, remember he was, he was speaking in the previous verses about the strong and the weak. But now what does he do? He singles out the more, let's say, the liberal non-scrupulous person, the free person, the one that's living in, the one that's living in liberty, freedom, right? Free will. And he's singling them out with who? The person, the, the Jews, which were kind of, they were kind of almost, I don't want to say the word legalistic, but they were. So Paul is speaking to them, and he's trying not to give them, put fault on anyone, and he's really given us two points here in these scriptures. He's talking about our obligation of our conscience, of what your conscience teaches you, right? From your spirit and the responsibility, then our responsibility from that, what, our, what God is showing us, not to, and that responsibility not to slow another Christian's, let's say, progress as they walk this walk. And I'll get into it a little more here. So in Romans 14, this chapter, we're facing again a question of different views. And I know you guys have probably gotten into discussions about different views and maybe sometimes gotten into heated discussions. 
But whatever, and what they're talking about here, they're going into this dietary, the dietary restrictions that the Jews were hanging on to. Whether, it's, whether it was all right to eat meat or at certain times or days. Or whether, we sh or whether they should be free from that. And also on, if you remember from the previous verses, on ritual regulations. Remember they, they were even having discussions about uh, whether they should, what day should they observe the, the Sabbath. Whether it was Sunday, the Jews wanted to observe their, what their religion taught them. These, and special days that they had. Personal preferences almost, kind of. And then he was talking about the matter of, of drinking wine or, or, or alcohol. And whatever it is, and sometimes you guys even know, you've, you've been around Christians, so, well, you can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't, you know, those are disputable things. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that it gives us, God lives and gives us the free will to make that, dis, in our conscience, to make that, that choice. So in chapter, verse, chapter 14, verse 1, all the way now through chapter 15, verse 13, this section we're in deals with the things I just talked about, showing that there was a problem. They had a problem in the early church, as there are in churches today. There are. And this, this whole section kind of falls into three divisions. Three, di di three divisions here. Here, I'll give them to you. What you must not do about these things, what Paul's talking about, what you can do about them, and what happens when you handle them in the right way. See, there's, there is a right way and a wrong way. So we already looked at what you must not do. Right in the previous verses. Here's what we saw. We saw that Paul tells us the first thing is not to criticize, not to be critical, not to be a critical person, or condemn each other in these disputable matters, right? In these matters that we, maybe even some of the things I just listed before. And because here, here was the, here's the reason why. There's freedom. We have freedom in Christ, a liberty it's called, a freedom in any, in any one of our lives that which only... Remember this? Only God has the right to correct. What does he tell us, Paul? We must not judge each other. Don't judge each other on these disputable matters. Right? Agree to disagree. Because it, why? Because Paul brings it out that we're, we're, here's what we're doing. When we do that, when we're judging, what you're doing is you're taking the place of Jesus Christ. Now you're becoming Christ-like. In, in not a good way. Because Jesus is the only one that can judge. Do you all agree with that? Yes? He alone, Jesus alone, has the right to criticize, condemn in these areas. When, when we take these issues on ourselves, here's what we're doing. We're exercising our own authority in place of Jesus when we become judge, jury in that situation, whatever it is. So let's look at this. Let's look at what we can do about some of these things. How we're to act. How we're to act towards one another in these areas that we were just talking about. And Paul, here's what he does. The first thing, here's, here's what the first thing we can do. Look at, look at chapter 14, verse 13. Here's the first thing we can do. Here's what he tells us. You there? Verse, verse 13? You all there? Therefore, he says, let us not judge one another. Uh-oh, underline that. There you go. Anymore. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. You can underline that too. See, here's what, here's what, here's what, that's, here's what he's saying right here. He's saying, because here, scripture, the scripture here uh, is, doesn't just say stop judging. Here's what it's really saying. It's saying stop judging, but if you want to judge, go ahead, but start with yourself first. Look at yourself first. You want to judge someone? Look at yourself first. That's what, they, that's what he's saying here. Judge yourself. And if you're pushing this freedom, your free, your free will, right? Your idea on someone, your freedom, right? You're pushing it on someone to indulge in something that maybe that person's not even, doesn't want to or is unsure about or has a weakness in, then you're upsetting them. You're pushing that person in a place that they're not ready to go. If you're saying, well, I'm free, you should be free too. No. Paul's saying you should have understanding in that person's weakness. Right? Are you forcing that person to go beyond their own conscious? You know, sometimes we call that peer pressure, right? That even happens in Christians, amongst Christians. It does. 
we say peer pressure, well, that happens in school. I've seen that in churches. And then people go down the wrong path, or they're not ready to go down that path, and then they stumble and they fall, and then sometimes they fall away from the church. They fall away from Jesus from some of these disputable matters. So what's the effect upon others of your attitude sometimes in this situation about some of these things that Paul was talking about? Paul goes on to give us two reasons. He gives us two reasons why we must not judge others. He's going to give us two reasons here. But must judge ourselves first. You always got to look at yourself first, right? You got to look at yourself in the mirror sometimes first before you go anywhere sometimes. First reason he tells us in verse 14. Look at verse 14. Here's the first reason. He says, I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Okay, so here, here's, this is almost kind of like a fundamental insight, what's going on here in this verse. Almost a funda- fundamental insight into our life, into life in general, that should govern our behavior. Because scripture was always good for that, right? If you want to know how to act or how to go forward in something, Scripture will give you that. Scripture will show you that. What Paul's, here's what Paul's really saying here. Here's what he's saying in this verse. As one who has been, ta- and Paul was taught by the Lord Jesus, he's saying as one who's been taught by the Lord Jesus, and again, we'll go back to the food here, no food is unclean in itself, because that was, come on, there was a split going on here because of food. And Jesus did say that, by the way. He did. He, it was Jesus who said, no food is unclean. But, and what he's really saying, simply put, here's what Jesus is saying here. When he's saying no food is unclean, right? It, the rituals of the law, which the Jews were under, including their ritual cleanliness, are no longer in effect for the believer. Did you hear that? That the ritual cleanliness, rituals of the law, are no longer in effect for the believer, for the followers of Jesus. And that, here's what this means about the food, and especially in this issue here. That the food means nothing in the matter of our personal holiness. Now think about this in a broader, broader text here. It doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that all foods are good for you. Because we know that already. <laughs> we know that there's some foods are not good for you, especially health-wise, right? And there's things, there's some foods that, are, that, that will kill you. <laughs> there's some food that if you eat in excess of it, will kill you. You know, I could give you a whole list of them, but... Because ju- here, Jesus doesn't mean that everything is all right to take in. That's, that's what he's saying. Not, uh, everything or, is not all right to take in. He's saying he means there's no moral question about food. There's no more, it shouldn't be an argument about it. It's not about the food. It's because it's, it's never wrong morally to eat what your body may enjoy, right? You may enjoy certain foods, and you sh- unless, of course, you, got, you want to take, you know, go down a, a health food, whatever that path is, whether you want to be a vegetarian, a, 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 a non vegetarian, he said, eat food, there's no moral law against that. But what you take in, he says, be careful. What you, and if your body enjoys it, go at it. Not in excess, though. Jesus taught that. He taught that himself. Then Paul says, he says this, that it's enough. Here's what Paul's saying about all of this, about this discussion about what's clean and unclean, these idle foods. And he, here's what Paul's saying. Hey, that's enough for me. If Jesus said it, I'm good with it. And it should be good for us, too. Because why? It sets us free. We're free. And that's the believers we're talking about here, the ones that were set free, and they were having the conflict with the Jews that were still holding on to these legalistic, the legalistic laws. But that's not, see, the whole thing here in this chapter, it's not the only problem here involved in this chapter. Because here's what he's saying. Our conscience, right, the things up here that go here, needs to be trained. See, as we go forward in a Christian life, this is a walk where, remember we talked about sanctification, where we're changing. And there's things that change that come from your heart, they come from your mind, right? And that gives us insight now into this freedom that we have in Jesus. But here's ultimately where Paul's, what he's, and I would say this to you too, even with each other, as a body of Christ, we're to adjust, listen, we're to adjust each other, one another, along these lines here. So, in other words, this. 
each one of you, in, we're all in different places in our walk with Jesus, right? And we need to make adjustments with that with each other. And that's what Paul's warning about here in verse 15. Here's what he says. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you can put in anything in there that you want. If your brother is grieved because of your beliefs about drinking, about alcohol, about whether to go to movies or whatever the situation is, these disputable things, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with, with your food the one whom Christ died. So in other words, what he's, what he's saying here, it, it's not really loving, it's not really loving to force people to move at your pace. It's true. That's not loving. That's what he's saying here, Paul. But it's loving to adjust to that person's that pace that person is on. Like if you're moving ahead, and if you've been around, some, sometimes you've been around brothers and sisters, you know, you're moving ahead and you're like on fire and there's some people that still are, they're kind of like, you know, they're, you're getting it, but they're just walking this, they're walking this walk and they're a little maybe, I'm not say behind, but their, their pace is different than yours. Paul's saying, don't, don't grieve that person because they're a little, they're not the same place you are. He goes, love that person. Take that person, put them under your wing. Because you know what that is? When that happens, that's an exercise of Christian love. That's what that is. When you can look at someone and you know, well, I mean, I, you know, I want to put my arm around and take this person along with me and I'll adjust my, my pace with their pace in, the way, in this walk with Jesus. That's what Paul is urging. He's urging this church to do here. And I urge you to do that too. The second thing Paul says in this whole section, if you will, is that the, is there issue of freedom versus non-freedom? And sometimes Christians, we get caught up in that. You see, because there's, look, the bottom line is, just like I said in the beginning, there's certain doctrines, right, in scriptures, we're to stand fast on. You can't, you got, nobody's going to change it, right? The virgin birth, Jesus is God-man, right? The, bury, the cru uh, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Those things, they're not, you can't change that. They're not, those are not disputable. Those are doctrines, right? And don't let anyone change you on those. That's not what we're talking about here. But not on one of these questions this morning, what we're talking about, we're, we're not to take that kind of unyielding view. Remember, disputable issues. That's what Paul says in verse, look, ver, look at verses six, 16, 17, and 18. Here's what he's saying. This unyield, don't take an unyielding view here. He says, therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Isn't that interesting? He says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. But, here it is, here it is. This, this is what the kingdom of God, this is who you and I are. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, there it is. That's what he's saying. It's not about eating or drinking or whatever you want to insert in there. It's about this. It's about your righteousness and peace and joy that you have in the Holy Spirit for each one of us. Right? And then he goes on to say, For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So if you're going to, look, if you want to create division in a church or even, even in your own family by arguing so hard for your rights, right? People want to argue for their rights all the time or your freedom. And I see that sometimes in Christians, right, by, by pushing your, your freedom in someone else's face. That maybe they're not ready for that certain freedom that you have already in Christ. Then you're distorting the gospel. See, that's what you're doing then. Then you're taking the gospel, you're distorting it. And Paul says almost kind of in a way that you're causing which is supposed to be good. Paul says the good news about Jesus to be almost blasphemed when you go through that, what, what we're talking about here. And... Because you're making too much maybe of an issue, one specific disputable issue over a minor matter, minor matters that become major. That's what we're talking about here. You're insisting on your own rights. Hey, because I do this, you should do it too. That are so important to you. Look, I've seen this where that sometimes in those type of attitudes will divide a church will divide a church and they'll, people will separate from brother and sister, right? We talked about who we are, right? Brothers and sisters. I've seen people separate as brother and sister over disputable matters. Not doct you know, doctrinal things are one thing, but something as simple as, you know, whether, whatever it is, alcohol, you know, you go into movies or smoking or some of the just 
silly things sometimes that we get caught up and hung up on. Paul says that's wrong. The main point, he's, what he's tell, here's what he's telling you about your faith this morning. He's telling you the main point, here it is, the main point of our faith, what did the scripture just tell us? What did it just tell us? It tells us this, the main point of our Christian faith is righteousness, peace, and joy. There it is. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Where? In the Holy Spirit. That's the main point of who we are. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. And you've seen, the, I, I hope you have seen the word righteousness already so far in the, in the book of Romans. We saw it many times in, in Romans already, this word righteousness. And you know what it means, I pray you do, that it means this, here's what, you remember? It gives us, that righteousness gives us now a sense of worth. This righteousness gives us a sense of worth now that we can stand before God the Father. The righteousness imputed to us through Lord, through Jesus Christ. It means God's, God's given us now this gift, this wonderful gift, this sense of worth about yourself. That's where you get your worth from, not from the world, not from the peripheral things in this life. Your worth comes from this gift that God has given you, this righteousness that you can stand before him, this worth about yourself. You are worthy before the almighty God. And it means that this, because of Jesus, because of the death of Jesus on the cross, on your behalf, you are loved by him. That's what it means. That you're accepted by him. That you are a valuable person in the, in the Lord's sight. Isn't that a powerful thing in your heart this morning? In fact, even this, God delights. He delightedly, he calls you his beloved child. This righteousness. That's what Paul is saying. Focus on that. Don't be focused on these disputable matters. Focus on this righteousness and this joy and this peace and this love. But this righteousness I'm talking about is something that's a wonderful gift that's been given to us. That's what we stand in. We understand from that also comes, and I pray you have this dignity in who you are in Christ this morning. Right? That you have this dignity in who you are and what Christ has done for you. This sense of this respect that you have that you, because of what Jesus has done for you. And that's what, you know what? That's what the world should see. That's what the world should see in you. This righteousness, this joy, this peace in the Holy Spirit. That's what the world should see in you and us as a body of Christ, as a church. Confidence. Confidence in who you are. With that, and you know what, with that type of assurance, and I know we all need assurance sometimes, especially in matters of things of the heart. And you know what, that assurance should come, I'm not talking about being conceited, walking around going, I'm a Christian, you're not. That's not what I'm talking about. The world knows nothing about sometimes the things who we are. If we stand for who we are and that righteousness and that joy and that peace, boy, people will say something's different about us. The second thing the world should see in us is, you know what? The world should see is righteousness. You know what the world should see in us too? A peacefulness. A peacefulness in us. Right? That comes, you know what? A peacefulness that might be seen almost kind of visibly. Not just a peace in your heart. But visibly in a way that um, a calmness about you. A kind of calmness that you have as a Christian. Yeah, right, you walk in that faith. You walk, we sung those songs this morning, right? We walk in victory. That inner strength, right? You should all have in your heart this inner strength that's not disturbed by minor things, right? Sometimes we get all hung up on minor things that we get all like, well, I know I do. I know I do. But we should have a calmness about us, an inner peace that we have. It's, it's almost kind of a calm... Have you ever been around people that are calm and quiet in situations that are bubbling out of control? I've been around people like that, man, and I really, you know what, and even in the secular world, I've seen people that are in those type of situations, that's, that's really kind of, you want, I want to be around people like that, especially when things hit the fan kind of, sort of, right? A quiet, but here's what, as Christians, we want this calm, calmness and a quiet assurance that God is present in the situation, whatever that situation is. Hey, whatever you're going through, God is present in that situation. Be calm. It's going to be okay. However that works out. 
that it's going to work out for his glory. Amen? Really, I mean, those are, that's an assurance that you can walk out of here with this morning. You can walk out of here with that assurance that it's going to work out whatever it is. And I know sometimes it's tough. It'll work out for God's glory. You don't have to get upset, angry, or maybe even vindicted towards something. You ever get, I, uh, you know, I call it sometimes revenge, but every, every, do you ever in your heart want to have vindictiveness towards someone? God says, no. That's not calm. Vindictiveness is not being calm. When something comes at you, be calm. Stand in the assurance in who you are in Christ. That's an important thing. That you have this manifestation of that gift of God, that peace that he brings to you. Every minute, if you let him. So here's the third part now, right? We have the righteousness, we have the peace. Now here's the, here's the one I think some of us sometimes we struggle with a little bit. Joy. Right, Paul says here, the joy, this element of joy. And, and, and by the way, these three... They always go together. They truly do. Righteousness, peace, and joy. They really do. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Because, well, first of all, they're gifts of God. They don't come from you. Right? It's not coming from you. They're coming from God. That righteousness, that peace, and joy is coming from God. Take that from Him. They come from Him. Receive that this morning. And joy is this. Here's what joy is. What I come to understand, anyway. That joy is a delight in your life right now. Having that joy in your life... That always, and, and try and understand this. You know what joy is? Trying to find something in your life and, and live this life in a worthwhile way. That there's, you can always find something worthwhile in your life to have joy about something, right? You can, if you really thought about it. Even though it might be filled with problems. See, that's the tough, that's the tough part about joy. Because we're all going to have problems. We're all going to have issues that we're going to go through. But can you go through it with joy in your heart, knowing that God is with you? God, you have that righteousness, that peace, that calm, that assurance. Joy. Joy in a Christian. And here it is. And you might think this, but it's, this, is, this is the truth. Joy in a Christian uh, doesn't come from circumstances. It doesn't. You might think it does. Joy, here it is, joy that is evident, here it is, joy that is evident is a witness. See, if there's joy in your life, here's the evidence of that. That that gift of God, he's given you that joy. And Paul is saying this, that what you have discovered, right, if that's that joy, and you're looking at something, if that is the center, right, if that's your joy, something's your joy, if that's your focus and your interest, then you can easily, here's, here's the other flip side now, think about what we're talking about, this chapter, you can easily give up some momentary indulgence, something that maybe you're doing that maybe might be bringing another brother down or sister down, you can give that up a little bit for that time, and maybe even a pleasure that you enjoy, and you're free to participate in, whatever that is, but if it's gonna, and if it's gonna make another brother or sister stumble, or get someone upset, to make them move beyond their own consciousness, meaning they might go along with you and they're not ready for it, and they might crater. Their Christianity might, their Christian faith might crater. They may not be ready to for your freedom that you have in Christ. See, the philosophy about being a Christian. Here's, here's the main word about being a Christian. One of the main words about being a Christian is to yield. A Christian is to yield. What, what does yield mean? It means to give way. That's a Christian. That's one of the things, main thing, uh, 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 if you want to use the word philosophical, part of Christianity and being a Christian is to yield, to give, to give way to. And, and really, okay, well, you say, okay, well, what's the guide in that? How, how, how am I guided in that, that yielding? Well, Paul, here's what he does again, right? We always go back to Scripture. Always go back to Scripture. Paul takes it up really here in this next section here, verses 19 to 21. Here's what he tells us. 
verses 19. Verse 19, he says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things from which one may edify another. Okay, so there what you see are guidelines in that verse. He's saying, what he's saying, enjoy. Enjoy your freedom. Enjoy the liberties that have been given to you in Christ, that you, that you as a follower of Christ. Indulge what you want to indulge in, what you desire. It, but if you do so in such a way that you don't destroy peace, right? Or building up a truth in something with someone. Or you slow someone's learning process. Don't do something if you're going to slow another brother or sister's process of becoming a, a more mature Christian. Don't, stump, don't make that person stumble. That's what he's saying. And he goes on further in these guidelines and he tells us, this, and I've seen this, whenever you're doing something, whenever you and I are doing something that threatens almost kind of like a piece of a, maybe the church, right? I've seen people have upset a church. Why? I, could, I, could, I saw one, one person upset a whole church or a group or an individual that they can't handle something. Then, and if they get angry, if someone, you get into discussion, like, Larry and I were having a discussion about something. If that person, if we got into a, a discussion about this specific thing we were talking about and just say, I got angry about it or, uh, and upset, and if I was in that position, maybe, maybe it was Larry causing me to do that, Larry should back off. Or I should back off and we just reverse that, whoever it is. Whatever that discussion is about, whatever this, you should back off. If that starts to get angry and upset, then you back off. You let the Lord. You, you know, because here's what it's telling us. Here's really what the scripture is telling us. That you who are strong, right? If you're strong in your faith and your walk, bear the burden. Don't insist on your own rights. Help that other person. See, a lot of Christians, we get so intent on our own rights that Paul says some of, some, some of those things are wrong. Some of those things are wrong. He goes on to say this in Romans, uh, look, look at verse 20. He says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Here's what he's saying here. Peace, uh, in a kind of way he's saying peace is the work of God here as we go, as he gets further into it. And nothing, and, he's, and he goes on, he's going to ultimately say nothing can produce a lasting peace, right? We all want peace among people, amongst us except the work of God. That's where peace comes from. A lasting peace. It's, here's, you want peace? It's the Spirit of God that produces peace. Isn't it? It's true. So, if you have, you feel you need to plant your flag and state your case for whatever that is, that you are free in some right and some liberty that you feel, free will, because God gives us free will, right? And that happens. You can destroy that peace by doing that, right? You say, well, I'm free. But wait a second. You're destroying what God has brought about maybe sometimes. And don't, you know, don't do that because it's not worth it. Because Paul's second guideline here, the second guideline here is this, that sometimes you have to exercise, to stop exercising your liberty, to kind of like back off, like I just said, whenever it stunts someone else's growth. Sometimes you got to back off. Because sometimes if you, you know, you can, if you stunt someone's growth process, especially here as a Christian, right, and, and you're in one place and they're in another, you, and you're kind of like forcing things down their throat or, or kind of pushing them, trying to push them along when they're not ready, they can, some, I've seen this too, people will turn away, they'll turn away. They'll get, they'll, get, they'll get hardened a little bit and they'll go, I, I, I can't handle this anymore. This, is, this isn't, I don't get this. And they, then they slowly turn away. Do you want to be responsible for that? You don't want to be responsible for that. Don't push people sometimes. Do not push people far or press them in a way. And be careful, he's saying, how you judge them. That's, what, that's what's going on here in this chapter. Because if you're doing things that upset people, they're going to get hardened. They are. They're going to get hardened in their views. Because I've seen it. So that they stop. They stop. They stop the walk. They, they stop. They stop moving on. Because it's like... And I, I kind of almost felt like that way sometimes in the early beginnings of my Christian faith. Where I was like, huh, these guys are... 
I don't know if I can ever be, I don't know if I can do this. I, I, don't, I don't know if I want any part of this because I wasn't moving at the pace of certain individuals within the group I was in. You're going too far if you push that. Paul, here's what Paul means in verse, look, look at verse 20 and 21, right? He says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things in duty are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine or do not do anything but which your brother stumbles. Remember, that's always the key here, brother stumbles. If you want to underline anything in those verses, don't stum make your brother stumble or sister stumble or offend them if they're weak. Because here, but I want you to, on those verses, I want you to understand something here. Be careful. Because Paul, he's not saying, Paul's not saying in those verses, it's wrong to make a person think. That's not what he's saying. It's good to make someone think, right? You give someone an opportunity, you give them a question, and that the person will receive that in a way because you're calm and you have joy and you have peace and you have righteousness. Paul says, that's a good thing. If you can have that relationship with someone where you are freely able to have those question and answer periods where that person can grow from that, that's a wonderful thing. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't just totally back off, but be, just be able to look at that situation and know where you're at, whatever that is. Right? And here's what it really is. You don't want someone to act beyond their own convictions, because once that happens, it can lead that person into places maybe where they can't, it's going to be hard for them to come back. And I know only the Lord can do that. And so here's what he brings now, Paul, into this third guideline as we continue on here, verses 22 to 23, these last two verses. He says, do you have faith? Here it is. Here's the question to you this morning too. Do you have faith? Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God, he says, Paul. And you know, in faith, here's what he's saying in, in verse 22. He's saying about, here's what he says about faith. It means almost, faith almost means the same as conviction in kind of a way. It does. Like, right, because our convictions, right, your convictions, my convictions, and who we are in our faith are born, how, how is our faith born? By the word of God, isn't it? Right? Where did your faith come from? Well, it came from looking at the word of God and the Holy Spirit speaking to you. He's saying here that, that conviction... He's saying, he's, what he's saying here, Paul, if you have faith, let God and God's word be the basis for your faith. That's what he's saying. Let God and God's word be the basis for your faith and nothing else. Can you take that to your heart this morning? You want faith this morning? You have faith, he says here, do you have faith? Have it before God. Well, that means let God and God's word be the basis for your faith. Nothing else, not faith in this world, not faith in me, not faith in your job, not faith. Those things are all things that we are part of this world. But if you really want faith and where you walk this walk with Jesus and to that sanctification and one day glorification, he says, faith will come only from God's word and the basis of your faith and nothing else. Do you believe that this morning? No, really, do you believe that? That's where your faith comes from, God's word. Be sure that what you're doing is not because pride on your part. Because a lot of us, we have pride. Oh, I know the word. I'm good. And you want to impart something on someone. Don't let it be what, something what you think. Do what the word of God imparts on your heart to give to that person. Not something you think. Not because of pride on your part, because you think you know every, you know, oh, I know scripture. I know, I know how to say this. So, so sometimes people want to show off how free they are. I'm free. I'm good. You're not. You better get on my, my train. No, no, no. That's not good. That's not good. Because here, here's why you're doing it. Because here's why you're in this place where you can walk in that liberty, that free will. You know why? Because you're doing it because God has freed you by his word. That's how you're free. You're free by God's word. And Paul says that if you do that, Paul says if you do that, here's what he tells us. For, uh, verse 22. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Well, if you really base it on that, he's saying, what, here's what he's saying here. Your action will be one in which your, your conscience will be free. Your conscious, if you're doing these things we're talking about and walking in this liberty and this freedom and this righteousness and this joy and this peace and this calmness, he's saying that your action, your conscience will be good. 
you, your conscience will be clear. You won't feel guilty. I know sometimes we feel guilty. I know we, right? We, we get this guilt thing. That here's, look, watch, here's where I'm going with this. As, as way sometimes when we're acting with someone, another brother or sister, as opposed to what really the Word of God says. He says, if you do stay that course on the Word of God, he says, you're going to be happy. Your conscience will be free. You'll be blessed. But if you don't, here's the, listen, if you don't do that, if you really haven't settled something in your heart and your mind and your spirit through God's Word on the basis of Scripture, and you're only acting on your, because you want to make, have your own freedom and indulge in things that you want to indulge in, if you do this, you're, and you still feel, if you ever do, you ever get involved in a situation like that, and then your, your conscience says, oh, I don't know if I should do this. This is wrong. Well, that's conviction. That comes upon you. And I, you know, the conviction, I pray all of you have conviction. Really, I do. I pray you all have conviction in something that maybe you thought you had freedom in, and then at one time, and now you step out in faith now, and you go, wait a second. That's, I don't want to do this anymore. That's, that's good. That's conviction. That's the Holy Spirit. Whatever that situation is, whether, I, I don't have to give you the list. You all know the things that you've done before, maybe that you previously indulged in that you don't want to anymore because of who you are in Christ. Your conscience will convict you. Your heart will convict you. The Holy Spirit will convict you. That's a good thing. You're going to be condemned by your conscience. So, by the way, that's a good. It is a good thing. I don't like that word condemned, but because if you're condemned by your conscience, you're going to feel guilty, and that guilt will. It, this is not a guilt like pounding you over the head guilt. It's a heart guilt. So Paul's argument here is this. He says this right in the scripture without faith it's impossible to please God there it is without faith it's impossible to please God that's that sounds simple but it sounds hard too it's the same place right because here here's what does faith mean what does faith mean faith means this believing what God has said that's what that's what faith is do you believe that book you have in your hand do you believe that's the truth that is the way that's the life then you have faith. If you believe it, that's all it is. That's what he's saying the word of God declares in your heart this morning. And he says, if you understand that, great. That's awesome. But be sure, but make sure that you're not acting out of pride. That you're so sure you're acting out of pride. You, you know what I'm talking about, I think. Not out of your own self, your own self-indulgence. And he goes on to say here, don't, and, and again, this is again uh, to you guys too as a congregation, as a body of Christ. Don't deliberately stumble your brother or sister. Don't deliberately do things that will offend them, right? Or make them feel uncomfortable. Think about, think about your brother and sister, not yourself. If you're in a certain situation, and I'll give you a perfect, an easy one, right? You're, you're in a situation, you're with, and maybe you're, you have this freedom where you, you go, I'll just do this. Guys can understand it. You're at a go to a ball game and you're sitting there with your buddies and a couple of your buddies are drinking a drinking a brewski and there's a couple of guys there that they just don't they don't want to partake, right? I would say in that situation they will let's put it this way they won't partake because maybe they have an issue with alcohol. And if you're with that group of guys, Paul is saying, you know what? If you, you don't assert your liberty because you're free in it, you don't have an issue with alcohol. He's saying, you know what? Don't put them in a position where they have to make a choice. I've been in that position. The, the word here is sometimes your liberty has to be so free that you don't force your liberty on someone else to put them in a place where they can't be, if that makes sense. I've seen that. So here, because you'll, first of all, number one, you'll hinder that person's growth. You might put them in a place of temptation. So sometimes you have to give up your, one of your own indulgences for the sake of another. So that they don't trip and fall because they're not as strong as you yet in, that faith, in the faith. Or they don't understand certain things. They're not in the same place like you are. Sometimes you have to give certain things up in a certain situation. And you all know, you probably all know already in your hearts, you're probably thinking about something that maybe you do that might 
hinder someone else that struggles with some things that you're free in. And here, and this is a really important one as we come to the close. And this is the third part, right? We said there was three guidelines. Never act from doubt. Ah, that's important. Never act from doubt. Act only from conviction. How? By the word. There it is. Never act from doubt. Act only from conviction. How? By the word. That's so awesome. Don't you? Look what God just told us. He said, if you have doubts about something, open that book. Open the book. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to, I'm going to show you something that might even put conviction on your heart and change you and move you. That's where you go. That's what he's saying here, Paul. By the word of God. By the spirit. By the spirit of God. And I know each and every one of you have probably gone through that already. Where you've been in a situation and I pray you have. You've, 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 maybe you've gotten advice from someone or talked to someone and you're still not sure about something. And, and you know what? If you're not sure, if you have doubt, open the book. Open the book and pray. Open the book and pray. Because then you won't act from doubt. You'll act from truth. You'll act from truth. And when that occurs, you're free. You're free from that conviction. Your conscience is clear. The Spirit of God. Because if these problems, hey, you know what? All these things are kind of what we're talking about this morning. If everything was settled, if all problems were settled, really, truthfully, if all problems were settled on that basis by the Word of God, by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, we probably even as a, you think about us as a church, right? We, we would be moving towards something uh, of freedom that is unbounding, that people would want to come bursting in here. That's what I pray anyway. You know, what, and, and what will happen to the people that you come in contact with every day? The world, I'll just say that, the world. What will happen, right? You're living in this freedom, in this conviction. Now you're worth the word of God. You have no doubt. You have assurance. You have righteousness. You have joy. You have peace, this calmness, this assurance about you. The world's looking at you and going, I want that. I think they do. I think people you know want what you have, but they're just not sure yet. They're just not in a place yet where you're at. Don't convict them. Help them along. Because you know what? I would want this for all of you. When people see you, they see you as free. And you're not attached to these things of this world. You are walking in a liberty and a freedom, not to do whatever you want to do whenever you can or whenever you want to do whatever it is. Not that kind of freedom. I'm talking about the freedom in Jesus Christ that you have. When the world sees that, it's almost like a, you're a light. You're like, it's like you're a light in the darkness. You are. You're a light in the darkness this morning. And Because you're not controlled by the things of this world. That's what you want the world to see, that some, you're different. Amen. That's narrow, that you don't have, you know what? And, and by the way, Christians, we always get, oh, you, are, you, you Christians, you're narrow thinkers. That's not true. We're not narrow thinkers. We're thinkers. We're spirit-led thinkers, right? And we have enjoyment in that. The gift that God has given us, this freedom. In Christ that we have, that the world, here's what the world, here's what I pray, I pray this week that the world sees in you, that the world sees the heart of the gospel in you, the people that you meet, that they see the gospel of Christ in you, that righteousness, that peace in you, that joy in the Holy Spirit that you have this morning, those gifts that God has given each and every one of you this morning, and that basis for freedom that we have in that. That's true freedom. We know about freedom. We know what our country is. We know where we're, the things that are, the freedoms of this world are being attacked on worldly things. But we have a freedom that's so much bigger than that. That liberty that we have. And the world's watching. I always say this. The world is watching. Especially if they know, oh yeah, you're one of those born-agains. You're, you're one of those born-agains. That's right. The world's going to watch. They're going to watch everything you say and do. You may not think so, but they are. They're going to watch what comes out of your mouth. They're going to watch how you interact with people. Especially people maybe even you work with. 
I mean, years I used to work, I used to be one of those, we'd get on conference calls and stuff and work, and people would be, uh, you know, <laughs> expletives and this and that, 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 that. And after a while, people started to realize, you know, if I was on the phone, if something came out, they would go, oh, oh don't, don't say that, Tom, Tom's on the phone, he, he, don't, he, don't, he don't like that. And I was like, yeah, that's a good thing. It was a little, I was a little uncomfortable at first. I'm going, whoa, these guys must think I'm really something different. No, I was free. I was free in that. I had let all that go. But that was just, that's just like one simple thing. But people will see, people will see how your actions, the speak, how you speak, how you interact, uh, you know, what you represent, who you represent. If you are, you, are you, are you a follower of Jesus? Well, you, I would pray this, that people will see, will see why you are a follower of Jesus. Because of the love that you have, this freedom, this joy, this peace. Well, I will say this to us. We, we, we come to this place, and I, I would say that we build each other, and Paul does tell us, as we do end here, he tells us to edify one another, build each other up. I pray you guys build each other up, edify each other. How do you do that? With love. With love for each other. That's the first place to start. Love. Receiving one another, right? In your aim, and I, I say this in, even to myself, our aim in life shouldn't just to be please our own self. I mean, I mean, I know the world, that's the kind of world says, you know, take care of yourself first. That's not, that's not who we are as Christians. We want to edify. I, you know, I pray we, you guys edify each other. That's why I say go to Bible studies. Pray with each other. That's edification. You know, you're, you're lifting each other up in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Those things are powerful. If you think those things don't stay with you, even sometimes, if you, maybe if you go to a Bible study, right? You go to a Bible study and you're sitting there and you're going, I don't get this. Or some of it you get. Or, or maybe you're going, I don't even know why I'm going. You'll walk out of there. And you, if you kept going, you keep going and keep going and keep going. You're going to walk out of there. And all those things that are going to be rolling around your head, eventually you're going to, it's going to change you. That's the great thing about who we are. You, if you, we're not going to stay the same. We're going to change in a good way from the Spirit. Our aim is not just to please yourself. And next week we're going to see that. Next week we're going to see that, chapter 15. Because these, chapter 14 and 15 are one big chapter, really. I don't even know why they separated them. And we'll see, we'll see who our great example is of this, right? Whoa. And what will happen to us, what will happen to us when we really begin to live on some of the things I talked about this morning. When you really live this life, when you really truly live this life, and that... The strong ought to bear the weaknesses of immature Christians. You should bear the... If you're a strong Christian, you, you walk alongside that immature Christian. And I hate to use that word immature, but the person is not in the same place you are. Right? While you're going through this. And build that person up in their faith. Help that person. Build them up in their faith. Not just for yourself. Because who are we following? We're following Jesus as an example. That's your example. Not me. Not the, the, you're following the example of Jesus Christ. And here, here it is. And I pray. I love this word. Or I love these two words. Like-minded. We're to be like-minded with each other. Right? And that's why I love coming to church. I don't know about you. I love to come here because we're all believe in Jesus. We're followers of Jesus. We're all like-minded. I like that. Because so much, so much, you know, we walk out of here. So many of us, we're, we're not around a lot of like-minded people sometimes during the week. And we get tested. We get tested a lot. We do. Look, you're a believer, help other believers. Not just people of the world. Help other believers. Help them. Help them that are ones that are weaker than you, that are not as strong in the faith than you right now. That's the message Paul has given here. No matter whether you, there's these disputable matters like they had over, over whether it's right to eat meat or not. And Paul's, we'll see in chapter 15, we'll see this. Paul's conclusion is to receive and we'll see this in chapter 15. And I love this. He says, we will receive one another as Christ, for Christ has received us. See, that's always the basis. That's always the basis. And you know what? It's true. Look, we must, 
then I'm going to do end this here right now. Because I can keep talking about this. Because I'm very passionate about it. Because I just see sometimes we just get so disjointed as a body. Not just this church, but sometimes as believers. Look around. Look, look at the church. Look how many, Just go online and look how many churches are preaching all different kinds of... They're preaching different Jesuses. They're preaching prosperity gospel. They're preaching all these... Some of these things that are just like... They have no sta- their standards have the standards have been disrupted, and people get confused by that. That's why we stay here, book by book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, because then it's not about well, my opinion or your opinion. It's about what the Word of God tells us, and we can walk out of there better, stronger, more loving, and not use differences for opportunities of division. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's what this is all about this morning, eternal life. And that's what I say to anyone listening this morning, whether it's online or here this morning. Maybe you have a, maybe you have a question about all this. Maybe you have a question in your relationship with Jesus, because that's what it's about, a relationship. And he wants that relationship with you. Someone listening this morning, and they want to... They, maybe you're in a place right now where you're totally lost, you're confused, you're in a pit. Or maybe even you just want a change in life that things just aren't adding up for you anymore. When you thought you were doing all the right things, Jesus says, come to me. I love you. I want, I, want you to, I want you to come and have a relationship with me. Why? Because I love you. And how do I love you? Because you know what? You're a sinner. You were a sinner. You're a sinner. And I took your sin. I took it to the cross. And I hung on that cross. And then I was buried. And then I was resurrected for you. For you, that person who's in that pit, who's in that place of unsuredness or in that place of maybe unworthiness that you feel like you're, you're nobody. I say, Jesus says, you're somebody. Come to him. And that's the relationship. First thing he says, though, is repent. Turn away. Turn away from your sin. You can do that. You can do that. Turn away from your sin. You know what sin is. Turn away from it. And each one of you know that. Are listening this morning. And he says, repent. And then he says, believe. Just believe in who, who I said I was, the Savior of this world. He says, repent and then believe. You know what? Those are two powerful things. And then he says, come to me and call upon my name. And you'll be saved. If it comes from your heart. If it comes from your heart. And if you want, if that's you this morning, turn away from your sin. You know what? Get up. Get up out of that pit. Get up. Look up. The Lord's, his arms are open. He's saying, come to me, my child. I know you're wayward. I know you don't, maybe you don't understand all these things. But I I, I love you. Come to me. Come into the family. And what that means now, you'll forever have eternal life. This this is not the end. This is not the end for you here. A lot of people think this is the end. It's not. You come to Christ, of salvation to Christ, you now have eternal life, meaning you live in eternity in a place you can't even imagine when you leave here in a place you can't even, the word, oh my gosh, you can't even imagine. You want to go to that place? Come to Jesus this morning. Come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.